Good afternoon and a very warm welcome. I'm so excited. I'm so excited, Helen, um, to be here doing a live interview with Helen Nicholson. Helen is firstly a dear friend and the, known in South Africa as the networking queen. So I'm very excited to be doing this as a special Heritage Day um, edition because I don't know anybody who's as passionate about South Africa and its people as you are. So <laughs> welcome everybody, welcome on behalf of um, Succeed. We're very excited to have you join us. Um, just by way of introduction, Helen is known as the networking queen. She is also a public speaker. You have spoken in 43 countries, Helen. So thank you, it feels like a lot. <laughs> not, not, not any of this. 43 countries, you've written two business books, which I'm big fans of. They often my referral books to go to. Um, started a business in Dubai and sold it in the corporate space. And plus, you're the two the single mom of twin daughters who are now 23. Are they 23? Um, but mostly, you're a very passionate South African and a budding entrepreneur. I would say not budding, but a very, very successful entrepreneur. So welcome. Thank you, Nishali. Sure. And uh, in terms of uh, base connectors in South Africa, I have often used Nishani as a as a case study for being an amazing networker. So um, I'm not, I think there's there's a lot of networking going on here. So I'm very honored to be there. Oh, thank you, thank you for that. And um, just to start off quickly, tell us a little bit about yourself. For some of us who don't know you and um, who haven't read your books yet, tell us a little bit about what you do and what you bring into this world. So um, I'm the oldest of four children. Wow. And um, I grew up in Edenvale, the Vale, as I said. <laughs> I went to Holy Rosary Convent my whole life. And then I studied to be an accountant, although it's a very um, a strange profession choice, because I didn't really know what else I wanted to do, and I enjoyed figures. Um, and then I got married, and I moved to Dubai. And in Dubai, I got my first inkling for being an entrepreneur, because I had the girls in Dubai. I was in the corporate world there, in the IT space. And when I kind of looked at what expat women, including myself, were dealing with when they were in a, often a foreign country with our family and often with our first children, and we didn't know how to, to do this whole motherhood thing. So I started Moms and Tots in Dubai. Wow. And that was the first experience of creating something from nothing. My mother is a teacher, and I realized that I was born to teach. And I got very excited when I saw lights going on in children and their parents' eyes. So um, I eventually came back to South Africa when my girls were three, yeah. and um, I started working at this business school, and that's when I got involved in leadership development. So leadership development um, kind of led me into this journey, specifically around networking and around women. And here we are, kind of yeah. going forward. Yeah. Many years. Oh, yeah. And I can't begin to tell you um, how empowering and exciting your women's development work is. I mean, I think you've changed the, the landscape of many corporates, opened many opportunities. So there's loads of success stories to, to share. So well done on that. Thank you. Well Thank done you. on that. That's the little bit about entrepreneurship and, and it's, um, you know, especially with COVID now, people are starting to have to look at the world of work completely differently. Um, what are some of your, your nuggets that you'd like to share with us today? So I think... Um, Professionally, one of my biggest learnings has been that agility is key and you've got to move and groove quickly. Yes. So the feedback we've had from a lot of our clients is that the smaller training companies have often um, been better than the big business schools, for example, um, because we're agile. So I think agility is, is um, and to change quickly. And I think I'm quite comfortable with change. I think it drives my team mad um, because they're worried about it because I'm the idea person. Apparently, I've had a, an official label this week. So um, thank heavens, I, they are very good implementers of some of those ideas. But I think um, it, it, the other thing I've learned around resilience mm. in, this, in this time is how important it is. I think that um, to take care of yourself because... Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually being coached at the moment, and um, part of my journey is I've got 
two speeds. One is full on and the other one is collapse. And my journey with my coach is how to access second and third gear. And I think in the time of COVID, we've got to have, you've got to access different parts of energy. And I think we're all tired. Yeah. People are exhausted and feeling overwhelmed. And to be kind and compassionate with yourself. And, um, you know, those I think would be my big lessons. Um, how would you, what advice would you give to your best friend is the kind of advice you've got to give to yourself. Mm -hmm. So important. And, you know, you've done one form of work, but I know for a fact, and you, knew, you do the gratitude. In fact, um, I learned from you about the gratitude, the, the celebration plate. And I taught that to the boys. They must have been 10 or 10 and 7 years old. And so we've adopted that celebration plate through our entire sort of uh, life as a family. But you are somebody who I know walks the talk. Because um, you keep a gratitude journal, and tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your gratitude journal and about that role, and um, and perhaps a little bit about the, the role of mindfulness at play, and how we build resilience in this time. Yeah, so um, probably about fifteen years ago, mm -hmm. I had an incident um, with my children where I was the tooth fairy, mm -hmm. and um, I forgot. So, um, and on this particular day, my twins' molar teeth fell out, and because they were identical twins, uh, physiologically things happened on the same day, and they went to run to see what the tooth fairy had left them, and I'm embarrassed to admit if the tooth fairy had forgotten, they were, their teeth were still in their slippers, and there was no money. So the worst part of the story, and this is the true story, is I did not just forget the first night, I forgot the second, third, and fourth night. <laughs> so by which stage I felt like the worst mother imaginable. And I'll never forget, on that fifth morning, I was brushing my teeth, mm. and my daughter, Sabrina, looked up at me, and she said to me, Mommy, I don't believe in the tooth fairy Aww. anymore. Yeah. And it was a real kind of dagger in my heart, because what I realized is life wasn't in a great space. It was Monday, it was Friday, it was Monday, it was Friday. Suddenly, we were in October of that year, and I thought, how did we get to be in October? Mm. I'd also put on weight, but I was hardly eating during the day, but then I would eat the fridge and its contents at night. I wasn't exercising, and it, it was largely, if any of you have watched a black and white movie, I felt like I was living that black and white movie. And it was at that point that I went to a program called the Corporate Athlete mm -hmm. in Orlando in Florida. And that was a pivotal um, program for me because the facilitator had said, if you're not exercising, one of the ways to start exercising is to stop putting your running shoes at the bottom of your bed every mm -hmm. night. And I did that. And kind of 15 years later, I still do that when I'm going to run. I run two or three times a week, but that led me to an entire new habit yes. of running, and I eventually ran the New York Marathon in yes. 2011. Yes. Yeah, no, yeah, I've only <laughs> ever run a marathon once. I thought if I was going to kill myself, at least let me do it in style in New York and not in mm -hmm. Mickey's Dorf or something. Um, so, the and that um, corporate athlete program, mm -hmm. there was a lot of, there was, you know, they showed that, that pyramid, which was physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And what I realized is you've got to have that whole pyramid in place. And mm -hmm. physical is often the access point to a more spiritual development. And I also have learned how to meditate at university. Mm -hmm. I learned, I did a course on transcendental meditation. And I always found at certain key moments in my life how helpful yeah. um, that was because uh, meditation makes you strong, yeah. makes you mean to be strong, and it makes you very focused. Mm. So it, it's, it, it really was my experience of mindfulness which led me to teach it. Mm. And the one thing I've realized, it's no perfect um, uh, scenario Sorry. because often, you know, you can do really well for a month or two and then fall off the wagon. At least I now have a toolkit that I quickly get back on track. The one thing, though, that I'm absolutely religious about is this, mm -hmm. is I'm not allowed to close my eyes until I've written in my go to two further. And, um, you know, so some of the things have been, in fact, one of the things that's featured a lot during COVID is how grateful I am that Sabrina and Catherine are not at school and that I'm not homeschooling them because I think that would have actually sent me off the edge. So, so um, you know, and to be grateful and aware of those things. And the other days where I've written, I'm grateful that this day is over mm -hmm. because it's been a horrible day. Mm -hmm. But I'm still, because I think you need to realize that your brain is a very negative organ. 75% of the people have every day are negative. Wow. Your brain is, is designed to protect you. It's constantly scanning for what could go wrong. Yes. And in, unless you um, appreciate that, and that's why you realize the gratitude is so important because you're then training your brain on how to be more positive. Mm. That's fantastic. 
uh, it's interesting to see that word is like 75 percent in, in like primitive fright or fright mode. Absolutely. I mean, I, I went to a talk with Adrian Gould, mm -hmm. and the CEO of Discovery at the end of last year, and he said that he believes um, pessimism is a primitive emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and he, why he said that is because that's where your brain automatically goes yes. it, 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 without any effort. He said uh, optimism is a much more advanced brain. So I quite like that. I thought, um, mm -hmm. yeah. the, I prefer to have an advanced oh, brain. Really? Because in other words, optimism is a more active brain state. Yeah. state. You've actually got to think and put things together to actually come up with an optimistic view. And as South Africans, I think we have a very negative um, view. We, we moan a lot. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I'm very careful about who I associate with, who I coffee with, mm -hmm. because um, I don't want to feel this, you know, constant negativity. And also, you know, by feeding the wolf of negativity, if you feed it, yeah, yeah, it's going to grow, mm. you know, so it's about changing that trajectory. Exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So let's talk about networking and how, I love the story of how, you know, that you say about the manger scene, how men and women network. Maybe you should share that with us and then we'll start there. So um, men and women network very differently. Yeah. So um, Italia Bonanelli, who has been a big mentor of mine, she um, did a study at Standard Bank many years ago oh, yeah. where they took men and women at quite a senior level in the organization and uh, they wanted to find out what was happening because for some reason the men were advancing more than the women and both groups had the same education, same background, same experience. Yes. And what they found is when they looked at the size of their business yes. networks, the men had much bigger business networks than the women. And the example that she always gives is if I was a guy and I was diagnosed with testicular cancer, for yes. example, I would tell zero or maybe one person in my close circle of family and friends. But in terms of my outer network of business mm -hmm. contacts, the men had on average 50 to 70 connections. Yeah. Women, if any of us were diagnosed with cancer, no, we tell them all exactly, we tell four to eight people immediately. Yes. So in our inner circle, so it's obviously much bigger than the yes. men's. But our business network only had 11 to 15 people. Yeah. So imagine your male colleagues got 50 to 70 people, you've got 11 to 15. Mm -hmm. Who do you think is going to get places in the organization? Yeah. yeah, it's not us. It's not us. And it's always important, you know, one thing that I learned through your books is that women don't um, pick up the phone and ask for something because they want an emotional deposit before. And men don't do that. They can phone their friends probably 30 years later and say, hey, remember we went grade one together. You know, I need X, Y, and Z. No, exactly. And I think women have a double whammy because yeah. I, I don't think they think asking for help is a sign of weakness. Yeah. Whereas, um, you know, superwoman died of a heart attack because she was so stressed. So, you, you know, it's just uh, we don't. We you need to ask. No one. Yeah. Uh, people aren't mind readers. Yeah. And I think the second thing is to realize how powerful the acquaintance network is. Just because you know we meet you here online, mm -hmm. um, we pick up the phone and say, I need help. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a, a new best friend. New best friend. You know? <laughs> I mean, I, I often say this to women, it, it's amazing how in our personal life, we're often very good mentors, yes. but it's often in business that we are we are less so. And, you know, even, even if I have to be networking something for you, it's far easier for me to do that than to do it for myself. Yes. So why do you think that is? So I think that we have um, worthiness issues you know <laughs> around uh, it's, it comes down to self-esteem and believing mm. in, in yourself you know because I say to people uh, often um, I mean a lot of our women's leadership development work yeah. is done around taking women's value packaging it and then communicating it yeah. like through your networks um, and women I, I hear all the time my work should stand for itself yes. I'm like well yes. we're going to see how far that gets yes. you we haven't been promoted in five years yes. So, and it's not about being boastful or arrogant. It's just about it, it stating facts. Like, to your stakeholders, do they all know what it is that you're up to? Yeah. So, um, I think that there is a way in which you can be comfortable and authentic in terms of who you are. That you don't have to be this, you know, kind of overconfident, yeah. brash, arrogant person. There is a way for authentic networking. Networking. Yeah. yeah. And tell me a little bit, you speak about acquaintances, you speak about, uh, you know, business network. Tell me a little bit about, I mean, there's nobody that tribes like you. Um, I think, Helen, you have an amazing tribe. And I must say, the last party that we went to was Helen's 50th, uh, just before lockdown. Yeah, 29th of February. 29th, we just, we just, just, just yeah. And what a bash. 
But what was amazing about that was the amount of women that surrounded you at that occasion. Like how many were there? 150. 150 women showed up at your party um, just because we're part of your tribe in some way or form. Um, and that itself was just like, oh, it gives me goosebumps even now, um, besides being a fab party. Um, but tell us about tribing and what that actually means. Well, I, I, there's a meme that uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen that says your vibe attracts your tribe and your tribe attracts your vibe. Yeah. And um, in, as I've gotten older, you realize, it, and people with similar value systems will be oh. attracted to each other. Yeah. And, you know, and, and to, um, you know, to actively, I love the spirit of um, Barack Obama yeah. um, speaks about amplification. Yeah. And I'm an amplification fan. And often when people graduate from our program, I speak about amplification. Because what happened was when Barack Obama was um, first elected U.S. president, there yes. were only two women on his um, uh, cabinet, your know, his um, Stop, house, yeah. you know, or his um, staff. Yeah. And they made a decision, those two, that they wanted to get more women on board. Yeah. So they adopted a spirit of amplification. So in other words, if Nashani said, you know, pitch an idea, then I would say, in it, you know, I agree with what Nishani said and amplified. Um, uh, because often women's voices are not heard in the true. same way around a table. And as a result of that amplification strategy, the first time he was elected, there were two. And his second term, there were six women on his staff. Wow. And they believed, so that is the power of amplification. So, you know, and that is, speaks to tribe. Mm -hmm. Because when we amplify each other, when women deliberately say, like, how amazing are you? Because I think we're so critical yeah. of of ourselves and that ability to you know really be there for each other yeah. like shoulder to shoulder we can do this together yeah. and um for me i'm incredibly appreciative and love um every um person in my tribe because yeah. we we share a bond and a value system yeah yeah and also there's a, there's always been i mean one one of the things that is signature to who you are is your uh, spirit of generosity and abundance you know, I mean, you just you just take it and you amplify many people um, in your circle. In fact, Helen has a black book um, <laughs> that uh, that you know, the moment you find something good, you just want to share it, mm. Uh, mm. which is amazing. Which is no, amazing. no, no, thank you, thank you. Like, 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 so if you tell any of us about a problem, then immediately our internal yes. relative yes. is going and like, who do we know? And who can, and you know, because I'm a bad emailer and I'm, I'm a one finger typist, like I um, I just want to, I send two people an email and I say, go and have coffee. And then they must just trust me that they must go and have coffee. They must, I'm not giving them the whole fat reason, they must go and discover that for themselves. But if they have coffee, then they will discover their synergy. And it makes me very happy to yeah. hear about that. And you know, uh, and that's how we met. Yes, yeah. we met when we met. Yeah. Someone had recommended it. Last night, it was back in 2007. Yeah, yeah. yeah. scary. It's scary. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen our children grow up together. We've seen our children grow up together. Mm. Yeah, indeed, we have. Well, what about that? I'm amazed to be here. Yeah. Um, and tell me, what is the difference, do you think, between um, having a mentor and having a sponsor in business? What is that difference, differentiator? So I think um, ideally people need a coach, a mentor, and a sponsor. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily all at the same time, but yeah. they, they fill a very different role. A sponsor is someone who amplifies you. Yeah. You literally will go and and a sponsor is a more obvious relationship. So it can be, you know, in other words, it's, it's fairly... Um, well, uh, people know about it. Yeah. Whereas a mentor is often a more personal Doesn't relationship. Yeah. And it's someone, so say for example, I have identified someone at the moment who I'm going to ask to mentor me. Yeah. So he um, ran a training business for many years. He's about 10 years older than me. And um, and he's accomplished a lot of what I want to accomplish okay. with a training business. Right. So in other words, it's the same industry, it's the same, um, I admire him. And um, I feel like I've got a lot to learn. And, mm -hmm. and often they are, um, they've been in the business for longer. Oh, they actually have that skill. Yeah. That yeah. Okay. 
and and then a coach would be someone who could be younger than you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, in many ways, I think that we should often have reverse mentoring relationships. Oh, I need a technology coach. <laughs> no, that's what we could learn. You know, when when our children and um, someone a millennial or a Gen Z yeah. actually starts to mentor you, it's amazing um, mm-hmm. what can actually happen. Mm-hmm. And then a coach would be someone who, it doesn't matter what their age is, but someone who identifies your blind spots and someone who's looking at the stories that you tell yourself that possibly could be tripping you up. Wow. Yeah. So it's a coach, a mentor, and um, a sponsor. Yeah. And as I say, not necessarily, because that would take up a lot of time. Yeah. You'd be yeah. like doing yeah. all your yeah. self development yeah. and no work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things we speak about is that if I had to meet, um, the CEO of my company or somebody who was going to establish my business in the elevator, um, you know, what, you know, what would I say? I, would, I have a couple of seconds, maybe, maybe a minute if I'm lucky. Um, what do I say to that person that gets them curious? So that's where your elevator speech comes into play, you know. So people say to you, so what do you do? And of course, we all know what we're going to do, we do, but it's amazing how hard it is to encapsulate because what you're trying to do is you're trying to package your value yeah. in one sentence. Yeah. And it's got to be crisp and clear. And that's why I say to people when you get to a red traffic light in yeah. traffic, I mean, there's not much traffic yeah. when you do, then say your elevator speech yeah. because you've actually got to rehearse it. So the when you're in the elevator with that CEO and someone yeah. says to you, So, Helen, Nashani, what do you do? Then I can say, My name is Helen Nicholson. I am the founder of a business called The Networking Company. We specialize in teaching people how to network so that they can take their careers to the next level. And that's it. So that yeah. it's important to also have that component in your elevator. No, it's critical because, I, in other words, that's what's in it for the other person. Yeah. You know? um, and I, another really good one I heard was um, someone said, I'm the underwear bra of the oh. organization. Because they saw self as supporting what everyone else did. And I said, that's a great example that's because good. then you want that person to be so intrigued to yeah. say, tell me more. And one of the times I really messed this up, long before I knew about yeah. innovative speeches, I remember I was in a buffet queue at yeah. a conference and a CEO who I really wanted to chat to said to me, so what do you do? Yeah. And I was like, yeah. and I said, I'm, I'm in training. Yeah. And wow. I mean, that's not interesting at all. Oh. And he actually turned around and started to speak to somebody else. <laughs> and that's when I really realized the power of an elevator speech. Yeah. Because when you go to a function and you're going to go into a restaurant and you come up to space, if you don't have an elevator speech confidently mm. articulated in, in your head, it's very hard to also introduce yourself to people. And ideally, you need three different so that. Yeah. You need a so that for someone who's in your industry. That's where you can use jargon. Right. So, you know, everyone else understands what the CFA and the CP3 mm-hmm. and whatever. You need a family one. Your family one's your hardest one. Yeah. Because often our our relatives don't necessarily understand. Yeah. My kids think I have coffee. <laughs> All the <day> in shops. <laughs> You know, so like how do you articulate yeah. it for your family? And then lastly, a client one, which is more outward focused. Yeah. And you would choose God. And then it's all about what problem do you solve for them? If you didn't arrive at work for six months, what is going to happen to their problem or their business? Yeah. And that's what your so that needs to be built around. Okay. So, and it's important then to remember, so what problem am I going to solve for that particular audience? Exactly. Okay. And then it's about, okay, so then what's in it for them? Actually? Yes. Yes, because otherwise it's all, you know, when I do this presentation, I show a picture of Sabrina and Kate and my children, and I always say, what we get wrong about innovative speeches is we often say, you know, and it's all about us. Mm. In actual fact, it's got to be all about the other person. Mm. And networking is such a key competency in the entrepreneurial space. So tell us a little bit, I mean, somebody wants to start something new, tell us a little bit about how does one go about doing this, you know? You start to hustle, (laughs) and that's what you do. Um, we've, do. got a, we've got a big sign in our office that says good things come to those that hustle. Mm-hmm. And I'm an unashamed um, hustler. I'm not saying, um, I'm not saying, I think you're much like me, you also wake up at like by 8 o'clock in the morning, you've had 12 different ideas. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I've also been on the phone. I make all my phone calls between seven and eight in the morning um, because that's when I'm at my most energetic. Don't speak to me after five o'clock, then you, uh, you get a, a, a real dull down version of me. But um, you've got to, and, and what I mean by that is you've got to constantly be looking at ways to add value. I think hustle often has a very negative association. Yes. And I'm looking at it as moving and grooving, like doing stuff. Yeah. Yeah, because it's hard out there. I mean, I, I, I was chatting to um, a friend of mine and her and I are on similar businesses. Mm-hmm. And we said, you know, it'd be really hard to go out 
and do what we do now um, compared to when we did it because it was it was easier then. Um, and but that's not to say this is where your network has to uh, really you've got to be in contact and you've got to be constantly looking at ways and what can I give not yeah. what can I get yeah because if people haven't heard from you for like 20 years and now suddenly you are trying to like sell them something that is not cool networking mm -hmm. that's that's SOS networking yeah. um and when people only hear from you when yeah. you need something yeah. and uh, that's not a great um you've got to have some kind of strategy on how you can keep in touch with your network and that's where social media plays a, a great mm -hmm. role because you know you can vicariously feel that you have you're in touch with that person mm. That's so exciting. And what have been some of your key lessons um, learned in this uh, period of entrepreneurship? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's probably uh, my Angelou's coach yes. um, that I said was one of my life philosophies is when people show themselves to you the first time, believe them. Believe them. Because the only time when I've messed up um, and trusted people who I'm sorry that mm -hmm. I trusted. It's when there was an inkling at the beginning um, yeah. around that person, and then I was like, "No, I'm sure they'll be fine." Because I, I really do generally try and see the best in people yes. until I yeah. until I'm uh, kind of um, proven otherwise. So I think that that would be it. I think that I've made a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. around recruitment, and I've got to have made a lot of mistakes around um, partnering with um, with different people who share different value systems. Yeah. And, and what do you think is, is critical if you're entering into a partnership? What is critical to look at? What are the flags you look for? God, I, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> so um, I, 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 think really I, I just think, um, I think it depends. It, the yeah. only time I've seen partnerships work is when you bring two completely different skills to the party. Yeah. So, you know, say for example, one is the, you know, strategy person and the other one is the ops person. Yeah. For example, then they, they both need each other. There's a symbiotic relationship and that makes sense. But I think one of the biggest challenges that I've observed and experienced personally is if partnerships need to, need to stay at the same um, pace, pace yeah. and want the same things at the same time. And it's very unlikely to happen mm -hmm. um, in terms of age, in terms of stage of life, et cetera. Because um, especially for women, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of how what we want changes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and when you have children, when your children are in school, and when they go to varsity, you know, all that, those are different um, career stages. And unless you literally are kind of two little twins um, progressing along this road together, it's very hard to do that. Yeah. And tell me, uh, what have been some of the, the key, key takeouts of networking that's so? Because look, when Helen recommends something, nobody, I don't question because I know you've checked it out, you've tested it. I know that you're good with that. Um, so, I mean, but sometimes things just go wrong. Yeah, no, they do. And I mean, I, I, um, I, I will always give a disclaimer. You mm -hmm. know, for example, if you ask me for someone to do negotiation skills, because a lot of my clients have been able to call this morning from one of our clients who want to know, like, which service provider would I recommend yeah. in a certain area? And if I have no direct experience, then I'll say, I believe that they're good. We haven't had direct experience with them. So that's my disclaimer. If I work closely with a person, yeah. I have a philosophy around the A-team, that we surround each, uh, ourselves with the A-team. Right. Um, and people know that. So I think that um, but if people do mess up. Mm. And, you know, and then, and at the end of the day, it's my reputation on the line yes. and our business's reputation yes. on the line. And I take that very seriously. Yeah. So then I would never go near yeah. that person again with a bar you and I know, no, which, we, we, know, know we, we know what we're talking about. Yeah. What we're talking about there. You know, um, Helen, with, with, the, with the pandemic, many of us are working virtually. Uh, many of us are having to work from home and having to juggle many things. Um, but tell us about your personal brand and your brand online, because I, I loved your article that says, you know, if you're not turning on your Zoom camera, and if you're, you know, you don't look your best at that Zoom meeting, you're going to turn into a no-name brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think that a lot of people are not realizing, I, I think a lot of people still think they're going to be back at work in November. Yeah. And um, I think increasingly we're all realizing that that's not going to happen. Yeah. I think we'd be lucky if we're back by July 2021. Yeah. So, you know, if you're meeting people for the first time online, um, you know, for the women that are here, do you look the part? Do you, um, I get dressed every day as if I was going to an office. Yeah. Um, I mean, we do have an office. I don't go there every day. 
but I think that you know just to take your brand seriously because mm -hmm. um the the I mean I was on a big call with a, a big consulting group on Monday. And one of the, the person was introducing me was sitting on her bed and the bed was unmade at half past four in the afternoon. And I mean, there she is. She's had 474 people staring at her in her unmade bed. And I mean, that's not a great um, brand. Yeah. And also to make sure that you don't have to put your camera on always, but for the important meetings. And I think one of the other thing that I've observed, people who are going to kind of COVID proof their career yeah. are people who, in addition to having meetings, set up little touch bases. Yes. Because power dynamics in organizations are shifting. Yeah. And it's often because you can't pick up verbal cues sometimes across the screen, you've got to make sure you have some touch bases mm -hmm. that, that are agendaless, where you can literally say, it can we meet at 7 o'clock for like mm -hmm. 20 minutes when we have our coffee together. Coffee together. Um, because I think that people are having such screen fatigue that they just think they can barely deal with their meetings and they don't, um, you know, they think it's too much. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, if you're not doing that once or twice a week, then I'm, I'm not sure that you are on top of the power dynamics mm -hmm. as they change in organizations. Yeah. And it's very important, it's very important because you've got to keep your, your network um, you know, going. going. You've got to keep your network going. So I have, I have tea and biscuits actually. Mm. Or a tea and biscuits. So let's have tea and biscuits mm. uh, at least two or three times a week. Yeah. Um, and it's really because I work in the virtual space, really just to, to touch sides. Mm. No, I think anything, it's, talk yeah. about anything. Your children, your, your like, like, you know, anything. what's happening. Yeah. But not, not work. Mm. So that's a really, really valuable tip. Um, and that's quite exciting. Um, you know, Helen, it's um, Heritage Day tomorrow. What is your message of hope for South Africa and for all of us listening? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's been a tough year for um, yeah. South Africa. Um, you know, I think that many years ago, someone said that South Africa is always two minutes to midnight. You know, we, we always, we, we, we'll go to the brink and then we pull ourselves back. Mm -hmm. And that is who we are. And in some ways, I think it's a strength and a weakness at the same time, because yeah. I think that we, we have a level of fatigue around that that is um, fatiguing our time, yeah. um, not just here, but, you know, internationally too. So um, I believe in our people. I believe in our country. I believe in our skills. Um, I think that we run the risk of defining ourselves by our politicians mm -hmm. or our government. And, and I don't think this is just a South African thing. I think it's around the world. Because I read somewhere the other day that someone said, if anyone wants to be a politician, yeah. that should automatically automatically disqualify them from being a politician. Because it, to yeah. be a politician anywhere in the world is actually so awful. Yeah. And it, it is the really good people often don't want to do it. Yeah. Um, and for good reason. So I think that we need to move away from defining ourselves as a country from, you know, whether you're in America, England, or here, around who governs us. They are so important because they're powerful. They, they can... Um, direct policy, etc. But the 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 vibe of a country is not determined by that. It's determined by people like us, people like you, and um and and that's what I hold on to. I think South Africans we're funny. Yeah. Um, we have the ability to laugh at ourselves. And, and, um, <laughs> no, and we, you know, and, and I think we, we and we come together in amazing ways. And those are the things. So I choose to focus on the positive. I think um you know I've seen the kind of a negative spiral that people mm -hmm. get into when they start to decide to immigrate mm -hmm. and um and i think in many ways you have to do that because you've got to justify because mm -hmm. yeah. it's a it's a very traumatic thing yeah but um you know we are here for the duration and um i love this country i love the people and um i love the weather mm -hmm. and it was only when i moved to dubai that i realized what amazing weather especially in joburg that we actually have no, I mean, because I mean, it's been like a bit like a Game of Thrones winter. It's been very unpleasant, and I even like winter. Um, and now it's spring, and the smells, and the yeah, it's just a divine. It's a divine time. Thank you, thank you. It's it's really amazing because, um, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever heard you speak negatively about South Africa. But you know, there's so much good if we just look. Mm. There really mm -hmm. is so much. There's so much bad. It, 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 it is bad, bad if you want to look for it. Yeah. So, you know, it all depends on um, what you choose to focus on. Yeah. And and yeah. Yeah. Primitive emotion. Primitive emotion. Primitive emotion. Is there anything else that you would like to add to the um, session? Anything that you want to say? No, I think that, you know, I always say to people, um, 
you know, your vibe is your tribe. Your tribe yeah. is your vibe. And I think that we decide your energy is your currency. And be careful where you put your energy mm -hmm. and where you get your energy from. Because, you know, whenever we have had lunch, mm -hmm. we have had coffee, and all the people that are close to me and our business and our life, they are, you know, when you leave mm -hmm. that, you've got to feel uplifted. Yeah. Because our time is finite. Yeah. And, and if you don't feel that, then you need to, like for me, COVID has been such a revealing time. Mm -hmm. You've seen things. I've seen things with people in my team. I've seen things with people in my family. I've seen things with people in our country. I've seen things, the both the good and the bad. Yeah. And I'm sure people have seen the same about me. And, um, you know, how do we hold on to that clarity mm -hmm. and actually take that forward? In, in our lives. Um, and coming back again to financial, of course, you know, when people show you who they are, the new thing that that's about. Exactly. It has exactly. been a very revealing and a, and a very a, a time of almost like clarity and mm. clearing. Mm. You know. And there's a gift in clarity. Absolutely. And I think that if we don't, um, I think it would be a great pity if we went yeah. back to the same way that we were um, before. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that we would have missed the opportunity of COVID because it's just been in traffic jams for three hours every day to be stressed out of your mind, not sleeping. Because that was the reality. We romanticized what our previous mm -hmm. lives were like because they were certain and they were yeah. clear. Whereas now, I think it, we've got to realize that, you know, not sitting in traffic is amazing. Mm -hmm. and if you're saving two, three hours a day, yeah. um, the, a lot of the boundaries have gotten blurred. And I've been doing tons of talks around mindfulness mm -hmm. and resilience during this time. And I can see that people are, are screen fatigued, etc. Mm -hmm. But there are opportunities now to relook at the way we live and the way we work. And I think we have an opportunity now to, re to craft a new way. And what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And to define it for ourselves, we don't necessarily have to go back to that Jersey traffic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if those people who come from Pretoria to Dover who spend like four hours every day, I mean, what is that about? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure in the future, our children will look at us and say, like, what were you thinking? What, what, were, you doing? what were you doing? Yeah, you know, yeah. it just yeah. doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it just it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, you know, you speak about sleep. Tell, tell us a little bit about the importance of good sleep. So you need to sleep your way to the top, unashamedly, for seven to eight hours on a great mattress. So, um, yeah, you really do. I, I am a passionate sleeper. Yeah. I sleep well, and I, uh, yeah, seven at least hours a day. Yeah. And I think that um, you've got to, I, I'm amazed at how little time and energy it is to spend on our mattress um, the circumstance of our food, yeah. our blackout curtain. I don't sleep um, with my phone next to me, we put it in the kitchen. Yeah. So, um, because I think if you wake up at two o'clock in the morning, then the temptation is to uh, shut off your phone. To get an old fashioned alarm clock. And the other thing is, I'm a huge Epsom salt fan. Um, you'll see the Epsom salt. Yeah. Oh, there we are. So, this is a, um, yeah, it's called Beyond Wellness, and I'm a huge fan. And um, you can get on a take lot. And basically, Epsom salt, you put a cup in your bath before you go to bed. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is magnesium sulfate that makes your body relax. Okay. And then I also take two slow-release magnesium tablets before you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. So especially for the people who are battling to sleep or waking up in the middle of the night. Magnesium also helps for that. Don't take fizzies because mm -hmm. they, they're too immediate. You want slow release. And also never take magnesium in the morning. Oh. Because that makes you very tired. Okay. That's, that's really practical as well. Yeah. Well, I think, and and the, the tips do work. And um, I mean, you know, as, as I get older as well, you know, I find that if I don't sleep properly, it takes me almost three or four days to try and get back into that cycle. Yes. And I mean, COVID, because the, the boundaries have been blurred, it's become quite difficult to, um, to like, you know, uh, craft out my sleep time. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I mean, people have really been battling with sleep. But, uh, you know, I think it's also about a paradigm shift. There was a paradigm shift around that, you know, you can sleep when you're dead. That's what some people say. That is a very old-fashioned paradigm. Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, sleeps eight hours every night. Why does he do that? Because he knows he's more strategic. I, in fact, think it's community service because I know that I am a much nicer version of myself when I sleep mm -hmm. properly because when I don't, then I'm not very user friendly. <laughs> That's, uh, that's so true, but um, it's the same as being hungry. And, and it's so funny because in times of um, distress or times of, uh, it's just a couple of things to remember, which is eat, sleep, 
Yes. Move. Yes. And I know and pray. Yes. But you know that, or meditate, or do mindfulness. But I mean, those four things are so simple mm. and yet um, so difficult to mm. do properly. Mm. You know, to have a balanced meal for six, seven to eight hours a day. I mean, it's still a battle for all of us. I think that, you know, one of the, there's an amazing book called Atomic Habits yeah. that um, I picked up, I think earlier this year. And in it, he speaks a lot around, because he studies people yeah. who have good habits. And yeah. he says that um, we focus too much on the habit and we must focus more on the environment. Yeah. So you've got to create the environment that supports the habit. So, like, my example of putting my running shoes this morning when my bed, I take over a whole outfit before I go to bed. Then it's saying to my body, tomorrow, mm -hmm. you and those shoes and that whole outfit are going to get out on that road tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So you're creating an environment that's produced, mm -hmm. um, you know, pr food prep. Is mm -hmm. often a big part of yes, um, of eating. Yeah. yeah, because often we eat badly when we're eating when we rush. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you can try and think of what the habit is that you want to change, yeah. and then how do you construct the environment around it, yeah. then you're much more likely to do it. And it just sounds so basic, but it's, as you say, it's so it's the little things, it's the little habits that that create the consistency. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Silas, you know, we, we're about the community and about yes. Rebel, and we're talking about um, beautiful fancy towel grid walls um, and this little box of, uh, of pads uh, are completely green and organic and um, not organic, 100% <laughs> organic fabric. Mm. Um, but would last to go up to five years and keep her in school, you know, or at work. I mean, I think, that, you know, we're involved in women's leadership mm -hmm. development, and one of the most terrifying stats that I heard a couple of years ago was that um, and the average girl in poverty can often miss a week out of school yes. every month. Yes. So cumulatively, that can be years of yes. your education, and it's because these girls don't have money to buy sanitary towels. So I think that, uh, so I'm in the absolute 100% of the work mm -hmm. that you do. And I think if there's anyone who um, is on this call who can sponsor or get involved in, um, you know, and I mean, I think you should post what black like, action people can can take yes, because um, I think it's a, it's an amazing cause, and I think um, I personally and our business are completely supportive of, of what you're doing. So that's that's nice. And then, uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. that's that was an example of that. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, thank you very much. No, such a for always for your support. But uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's seventy five percent. We can reduce absenteeism by seventy five percent. Yeah. And I think with the GBV, I mean GBV is a cliche, um, almost a cliche now, but it has always existed. Mm. And South Africa, and unfortunately Johannesburg, very sadly, is actually the main capital of the world. Mm. And you know when these girls are alone at home, they are also prey. Mm. To, oh. to, to, to violence and all kinds of things. So we want to stop that. We want to just be practical about it and just, you know, curb it. Um, and send the girl to school. Just send her on her way. You know, give her that equal footing. So, um, yeah, that's that. So I, I think please post on the uh, well, shiny what we can do because I think there are a lot of people who are watching this either live or um, afterwards mm -hmm. who want to take some kind of action because I'm a great believer is put your money where your mouth is. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for that. Yeah. And um, let's see what else we'll say. Um, just say anything else you want to talk about? No. Ella, I just preach. We've spoken about so many things here. Yeah, I kind of, hmm, I think I've said everything I want to say. I'm a great believer to be bright, be brief, be gone. Um, you know, like the, because often speakers, we, we get very carried away with our own voices. So I'd like to think that. Um, I like to say short, sharp, and sexy. Yeah, exactly. I like it too. Yeah. So no, short, I, think, I think I've said, um, spoken about South Africa, yeah. um, sleep, which I'm passionate about, and um, yeah, sleep your way to the top. <laughs> Through COVID. Through COVID. And see what's on your camera. And put on some makeup. <laughs> and let's rock. Yeah. Still have coffee and biscuits. Mm. Coffee and biscuits. Coffee I and like biscuits. That. Coffee and biscuits. You know, actually. So thank you very much, Ellen. We've come to the end of our interview. And I just really want to say thank you. It's such an honor to tap into your um, years of experience. And thank you for so generously sharing that with us. It's um, an exciting thing. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, everybody. And on behalf of Succeed and my partners, Richard and Patrick, I'd like to say thank you very much.
Um, and may God bless you and make he make his face to shine upon you. And I also hope that hope always lights your path. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.